Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Maryam Abdullah, a professor in orthodontics at the University of Jordan. And today's lecture is going to be about craniofacial growth and development. This topic will be covered mainly from Chapter 2, uh, Contemporary Orthodontics, Sixth Edition by Prophet. Um, the other two references are for you to read if you needed more uh, information. Uh, the figures, the tables are very useful. I'll provide you with handouts. Chapter two from Prophet, I want you to focus on the first, um, third, fourth, fifth uh, headings. The second one, methods for studying physical growth. No need to read, you can read it for extra knowledge. Uh, social and behavioral development, we're not gonna cover this, okay? But the rest of the headings is gonna be properly covered in this lecture. Uh, the outlines should include growth versus development for you to understand the difference. Um, just uh, very, very lightly remind you of the basic embryologic development, postnatal growth, growth pattern, variability and timing, nature of skeletal growth, sites and types of growth in the craniofacial complex, um, and then theories of growth control. Many sites and types of growth in the craniofacial complex and theories of growth control will be covered in the second lecture. Why do we need to know this uh, as a dentist, as a general dentist? Well, this basic knowledge is important for all dentists, not only the orthodontist. It's important to know what's considered normal so that when we examine the patient, we'll be able to identify what's deviating from that normal, what's, be, what's considered an abnormal development. When we talk about the word term growth and development, we usually use them together, but growth merely means increase in size. And this usually results from increase in the number of cells or the size of cells, but it's mainly increase in size. On the other hand, the development is mainly related to the physiological and behavioral phenomena. It's related to the increase in sophistication, complexity, specialization. And this is why we need to use both words together when we talk about the craniofacial growth and development, because it's not only increase in size, but there is increase in the complexity and the specialization of the, dif of the different structures of the face. So to start off with, after the a fusion between the sperm and the egg, uh, and that's day zero, from day zero to 14, uh, we call this phase the zygotic phase, and this is merely increase, uh, rapid increase in number of cells. And then gradually they start to uh, specialize, and that's between week number two to eight, and this is the embryologic phase. Um, week number eight, all the way to birth, is the fetal period. Um, during the third week, we call it the gastrulation. We usually end up with three layers, and that is mainly the ectoderm, uh, endoderm, and the mesoderm, and we call it the trilaminar disc. At the top of the ectoderm, right in the middle, we will start to have grooving of the uh, cells, and this is what we call the neural groove. Eventually, this groove will develop into a tube, and then there we will have surrounding cells, very special surrounding cells called the neural crest cells. These neural crest cells will start to migrate later on into the different parts of the face and it will contribute to its development. Uh, so this part is important. It is important to know the different uh, derivatives of uh, the different uh, germ layers but mainly those related to uh, the craniofacial area. So uh, for us here, the ectoderm, so this is mainly the surface ectoderm. So this is the enamel. It gives rise to enamel. Now the, uh, the neural crest cells and the neural tube ectoderm are important. The tube itself will give rise to the central nervous system, obviously, but the neural crest ectoderm that will start to migrate both, both uh, sides that laterally 
will contribute to the development of the different connective tissues of the head and neck. And we call it the ectome as enzyme. Uh, and of course, it will contribute to the dentine, cementum, and other structures. In terms of the skull and some connective tissue of the head, well, this could be part of the mesoderm. And some muscles of the head uh, also could come from the paraxial part of the mesoderm. So I'll be providing you with this table. Now, the pharyngeal, um, uh, or what they call the pranchial apparatus, are uh, processes that develop at both sides uh, of this area here. And if we take a cross section, so we see only the one side, and that is the uh, left side. If we take a cross section at this part here, we will see actually both sides. The pharyngeal arches or our um, processes uh, will contain each will contain the parts of the ectoderm at the outside, and then the mesoderm, and then the endoderm at the inside. In between each arch and the next one, we will have the pharyngeal membrane. From the inside, this pharyngeal the pharyngeal membrane we will call it the pharyngeal pouch at the outside we call it the pharyngeal cleft and then each arch with all its components will give rise to different deriv derivatives what is concerning us here is arch number one it will give rise to the cranial nerve trigeminal nerve cranial nerve number five and this will give rise to the maxillary process the mandibular process and muscles of mastication uh, while uh, pharyngeal arch number two uh, will give rise to facial nerve number seven, that's the, the facial nerve, and it will give rise to muscles of facial expression. So you need to know in general the derivatives of the pharyngeal arches, as I said, but mainly those related to the craniofacial structures. Now, um, the we talked about the zygomatic uh, phase and the embryologic phase, etc., etc. Now, after birth, from first day all the way to the first year of life, we call uh, uh, the baby an uh, infant. So this is the infancy stage of life. And then comes next the childhood phase. So from the first year to the sixth years, this is early phase of childhood, six to 10 middle phase, 10 to 15 is the late phase. And then we will have the adolescence stage. And you can see there is an overlap between the late phase of childhood and the adolescence stage because we know adolescence is really marked by the sexual maturity and this varies between individuals. So for male 14 to 20 is called adolescence, for females 13 to 20. Uh, and it's important to know the different the names or terminologies of different stages because uh, it's important in terms of timing of treatment, in terms of diagnosis of different features. So now we're going to talk about the uh, growth in terms of pattern, variability, and timing. When we say pattern, it's important to understand that it is the physical arrangement of the body at any one time. Uh, and that is the pattern of spatial proportion part. So how things are related to each other. If how things relate to each other change over time, then we call this the pattern of growth. Okay, so the pattern, how things are related to each other and how they change over time is the pattern of growth because we said growth is increase in size or change in size. Now, if we want to talk, if we want to talk about the pattern of growth of the body in general, then between the second month intrauterine, so this is the fetus, and fourth month intrauterine, uh, you will find that the head is really taking large part of the proportions of the body. And especially the cranial part of the face is also taking large part of the face in general. So third month intrauterine, the head will contribute about 50% of the total body length, while the cranium usually more than that part related to the face. At time of birth, you will find that these proportions change. So the head gets smaller relatively, relative to the rest of the body portions. 
and it will contribute to 30% instead of 50, while the legs will contribute to about one third of the total body length. Eventually, when we reach the adult stage, the head will contribute only to 12% of the total body length, while the uh, legs will contribute about half percent. Now, this doesn't only apply to the body in general, but it also applies to the head itself. So, if we look at the cranial area relative to the face at birth, it contributes to a large proportion. During adulthood, this large proportion is decreased, actually, and we will have the, the, the maxilla and the mandible will start to take part of this percentage, larger part. Now, the axis of increased growth extending from the head toward the feet, this pattern of change is called the cephalocaudal gradient of growth. So, as we go from the top of the head all the way to the feet, the ratios of growth will start to change. So, more at the head, less toward the feet. And then, gradually, we will find that this uh, proportion will change, so we will have less at the head and gradually the, the other parts of the body that is toward the feet will take its part of this proportion. So this is uh, maybe showing you the uh, ratios in a better view. So as the cranial part is taking more than half at this stage of development, as we go further, it will take less proportions the maxilla will start to, 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 to take over. And then finally, at adulthood, we'll start to see that the mandible is taking over. So this increase in growth as we go from the top of the head all the way down doesn't only apply to the uh, total body structure, but also apply to the head itself. So the cranium here will finish first in terms of growth. The maxilla will finish later, and then the latest is the mandible. It will grow further and later. This differential growth is very important. So we call this axis of differential growth the cephalocaudal gradient of growth. Uh, another way to look at the pattern of growth is these Camon's curves. Uh, it's supposed to be curves because we have four curves, actually. Each one represents different uh, tissue system. So let's take the lymphoid tissues. So from birth all the way to 10 years of age, we will have a rapid growth in the lymphoid tissues, reaching about twice the size of the adult lymphoid tissues. And then gradually, this will shrink with time all the way until about 20 years of age, we will have the 100%, the, the normal size of the lymphoid tissues. Now, the neural tissues will follow a different pattern. It will grow steadily from birth all the way till about seven to eight years of age. We will have most of the neural tissues develop well, and this is the brain mainly. Uh, and uh, here we will have a nice plateau because we reach the maximum all the way till the adulthood, the 20 years. The general tissues will have two two uh, uh, plateaus. The first one is like an S shape and it represents the general tissues, the somatic cells. And the first one is about, about at about two to three years of age, we will have like a rapid growth and then we will have declination of the speed. And then at the growth spurt, the uh, adolescence growth spurt, we will have another increase in the uh, growth in general in these tissues so it's like s shaped with two plateaus finally the genital uh, types of tissues uh, will uh, have very slow development rate all the way till the sexual maturity and that is the adolescence growth spurt and it will have a rapid increase all the way till the 100 percent uh, at about 20 years of age so this pattern of growth for these four different tissues is called is represented in this Cummins curve. Um, now, if we look at the uh, adolescence stage, it seems very important period of life 
because we will get the sexual maturity uh, and that includes the secondary sexual characteristics and the adolescence growth spurt. This is important. And the fertility and the profound physiological changes. For us as orthodontists and for you as dentists, this is important because during the adolescence growth spurt, uh, we will have transformation from the mixed dentition where we have permanent and deciduous teeth into the permanent dentition and this stage of dental development is very important we could do a lot of uh, preventive and interceptive and, and maybe active orthodontic treatment also at that stage we will have an accelerated overall rate of facial growth but mainly differential growth of the jaws when we say differential growth of the jaws we mean the cephalocaudal gradient of growth that we just talked about where we have the maxilla will grow first followed by the mandible but the mandible will grow later and uh, more than the maxilla so this is what we call the differential growth of the jaws now um, do we know exactly when the adolescence growth spurt occurs well there is an average time for boys 12 to 14 years of age for girls 10 to 12 but we have lots of individual variations and uh, but we always know that boys will uh, have this uh, growth spurt two years later than girls so when we talk about individual variations we know that the 12 to 14 for boys and 10 to 12 for girls represent the average to the mean and actually we have lots of variations surrounding it this is the one standard variation plus minus and that represents about 68 percent of the population and then the two standard variation that represent about 95 to 97 of the population so even if we're talking about the mean maybe your your patient will not follow the actual numbers they will be sitting here or there but still the average is important for a, as, a, as a guideline so this is what we call growth variability different ethnic groups could vary uh, you know boys and girls will vary for sure and then the percentile growth the standard deviation to the norm will vary as well we have very important charts that the pediatricians usually use and this is to follow up the patient uh, relative to uh, uh, the average relative to other children of his age and also relative to his own progress over time so you can see here this represents the weight and this represents the stature, the height. And this is the first visit. So this is the age. So this patient was about seven years of age and this is his height, 120 something, 22 or 23. And the first visit here, the patient was seven and he weighed about 25 kilograms, for example. And this is the second visit, and this is the third visit, and this is the third, and so on and so on. So it seems that the patient, this is the dark line here represent the average, and then one line above, one line below represent the one standard deviation plus minus, and that the second line represent three, uh, sorry, two uh, standard deviation plus minus, and then the third line and so on. So if we look at this kid, for example, we will find that he is above the average, but consistently, this kid is above the average, which is okay. I mean, he's following one pattern of growth and this is good. The same with the weight. So he, uh, this kid is above the average. He's following the one standard deviation above, but he's consistent, so this is fine. Um, uh, as I said, this is the standard growth chart. Now let's take this example. This is another example of a child. This is the first visit, second visit, third visit and so on and the same with the weight so you can see that the patient was following exactly the average for the first three visits and then later on we had deterioration of his condition the same with the height the same with the weight and this will indicate that there is a problem 
uh, going on with this child and this is and an, uh, uh, it was important to follow up this kid and, and start diagnosis and treatment so the standard growth chart is very important to diagnose the kid relative to his uh, peers let's say to the kids at the same uh, age and also to follow up the kid over time now that we have two types of curves um, that we need to understand uh, this is the speed curve and it's simply telling you that when the patient was for example two years of age what was his height when he was 10 years of age what was his height so it, it's, it's not that much informative because everyone is going to increase in height uh, with, uh, over time the red line is the velocity line, and this is important because it tells you that between two and four years of age, for example, the patient gained gained about six to seven uh, centimeters. So this is the change in height. When he was eight years of age, he, he or she gained again seven. Nine years of age, only four centimeters. And then we had at 14 years of age, we had 12 uh, centimeters increase in height. So this is more informative. It just tells you what the change happened. And this is a rapid change. And at this age, we can actually uh, identify what we call the peak height velocity. The peak height velocity is very important because it can tell you when the Adolescent growth spurt will happen, and usually it happens about, it happened actually one year before the peak height velocity. So if 14 is the peak height velocity, so maybe at around 12, the patient started to have his adolescent growth spurt. So this is the best indicator of the adolescent growth spurt, um, uh, let's say, prediction. So this, this is just to show you the difference between boys and girls in terms of the speed uh, curve. Not, not a lot informative. I mean, everyone's going to uh, gain height with time. But the velocity curve, you can see that both of them are following the same pattern, but then suddenly the, girl, the girls are gaining height rapidly at 12 years of age. So this is the peak height velocity while boys are around 14 years of age so this is a different velocity curve and it can actually guide you into the uh, when the growth uh, adolescence growth spurt actually occurred so if i want to know the timing of growth we can rely on the chronological age which is simply number of months after birth and months and years but unfortunately, the chronological age was found to poorly correlate with the general development uh, of the body and growth status. What is more relevant to the growth status is the biological age. Biological age, there are different ways to look at the uh, biological age, starting with the dental age. You can get a clinical examination of the patient in addition to uh, an RPG, orthobantogram, panorama, so that you can actually assess the dental age. And a lot of the time, the patient would be, for example, 11 years of age. And then you will look intraorally and look at the radiograph and you say, oh, this is dental Lee. From a dental point of view, he looks like a nine years of age. So uh, another uh, type of age is the sexual maturity. So this is the sexual age. And then the skeletal age. Uh, and the skeletal age usually assists taking into consideration the uh, small bones of the wrist. So they take a hand wrist radiograph and they compare it with a, an atlas that has a different stages of development and uh, prediction of the maturation of bone and then they can guess the skeletal age for the patient accordingly and then we have the morphologic age and that is mainly the peak height velocity uh, that, that, that we talked about and we said this is the best indicator for the adolescent's growth spurt 
Now, we're going to talk about certain termolo terminologies that is important for understanding the skeletal growth. Uh, so there is only three possible growth mechanics uh, at the cellular level. Hyperplasia, hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is mainly increased in the number of cells. Hypertrophy is mainly increased in the size of the cell. And then the third mechani mechanism of uh, increasing uh, in size, and that is growth, is the secretion of extracellular materials. And this is mainly contributing to the growth uh, of the uh, bone, the skeletal system. Hyperplasia is prominent for all forms of growth in general. So this is increase in number of cells. Hypertrophy is important mechanisms, is less, sorry, less important mechanism than hyperplasia, while the secretion of extracellular materials is important uh, for the skeletal system. So we get the osteoblast, they start to secrete uh, extracellular material and then they calcify, they form a layer and then it will move on to excrete more extracellular materials, they calcify and so on, like layer by layer. Now in terms of uh, soft tissue, how does growth occurs in soft tissues? Mainly the type of growth is the interstitial growth and that is growth in all the points almost at the same at the same uh, level and this is not possible for calcified tissues so in hard tissues if the tissues are already calcified we cannot go through interstitial growth but we will go on what we call a uh, direct or surf a surface apposition of bone what we call bone remodeling uh, bone remodeling is a selective areas of bone resorption and other areas of bone apposition and that will cause the change in size and shape etc. Um, so when we have the start of mineralization uh, of the extracellular secretions that was made by, by the osteoblast, if they start to mineralize, that's it. It's not possible to go through interstitial growth. We will go through the uh, bone remodeling. Now, if we want to talk about bone formation, there are two um, types of ossifications. The first one is the endochondral ossification. And this is where we need cartilage to start off with, to start to form bone. So we will have a piece of cartilage. This piece of cartilage will be invaded by blood vessels. Blood vessels will provide us with the different elements needed to form bone and that would be uh, the, the osteoblast and the other cells, they start to secrete extracellular materials and then this extracellular material will start to calcify. Eventually we will have the bone spots or islands starting to appear, centers of ossification. These centers of ossification will increase in size and the parts of cartilage will reduce in size until we have islands of bone meeting. So they might fuse or we might have remnant, remnants of cartilage to continue growth at that area. So this is what we call endochondral ossification. The best examples are, sorry, I had my cat trapped in the room by mistake, so I had to get it out. Okay, so the, the, the example on the endochondral ossification uh, is, of course, the cranial base, and that includes the ethmoid, sphenoid, and the basooccipital bone, and, of course, the epiphyseal plate cartilage for long bones. The other type of ossification is the intramembranous ossification, and that actually doesn't need cartilage to start off with. We can start bone formation simply within connective tissues. So we have areas of connective tissues that will get invaded by blood vessels. Blood vessels will provide us with all the elements necessary to start formation of bone. We will have secretion of extracellular fluids and this will become calcified and we will start to have islands of bone. And then these islands of, of bone will start to grow uh, on the expense of the size of the connective tissues and so on and so on and so forth. 
the best examples uh, to understand is the dismal uh, cranium, and that is the cranial vault, the maxilla, and the mandible. Um, and here we have concepts that we need to understand uh, before we start uh, our next lecture on um, the different parts of the craniofacial uh, area and specific growth changes. So the first concept is the center of growth versus site of growth. Center of growth is an area where growth occurs and is controlled. So growth occurs independently. So if you isolate this area, center of growth, if you isolate it from the surrounding structures, it will still continue to grow anyway because it has everything it needs. It is independent. On the other hand, site of growth is merely where growth is actually happening. So if you isolate the site of growth, it will fail to continue to grow because it doesn't have everything it needs. So it's important to, to be able to identify the difference between these two concepts. And here comes the cartilage, two types of cartilage, the primary cartilage that is considered growth center. So if you have primary cartilage, like for example, the uh, uh, cartilage of the nose, of the nose, and you isolate it, uh, it, it should continue to grow. Uh, on the other hand, the secondary cartilage is simply rough site, like the head of the condyle. If you isolate the head, the head of the condyle from the surrounding structures, it will fail to grow because it is a growth site. It doesn't have the uh, control factors that is necessary to initiate and, and to control growth. Bone remodeling means a selective bone deposition and resorption, and it's important to maintain the, uh, uh, the proper shape and size of a piece of bone uh, relative to the surrounding structures. And then we have two types of translation or displacement, the primary translation or displacement and the secondary translation or displacement. Primary, it means the structure is itself actually did grow actively and it resulted in the change in its position. So it actively moved. Secondary translation, it means that uh, this structure was attached to other surrounding structures so the surrounding environment changed and passively this structure resulted in changing its position. It's like a reactive or passive movement, not an active movement. It changed its position because the surrounding structures actually did grow or changed in position. Okay, uh, this will make more sense when we talk about uh, more uh, clinical examples. Other terminologies that are important for you to understand is the neurocranium, because in some books you, you will come to these terminologies, and the physiocranium. The neurocranium are the uh, part of the skull that surrounds the brain, and this is why it is called the neurocranium, and that includes the calvaria and the base of the skull. Physiocranium is mainly the uh, rest of the facial skeleton and its associated structures like, for example, the maxilla and the mandible. Uh, so the sites uh, of growth that we'll be talking about in our next lecture is going to be mainly these four areas, the cranial vault, the cranial base, the maxilla, and the mandible. That will be all. Thank you for listening.